let's start off with what's simple. Graffiti saved my life. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the land of the original gangbanger, in a economically and socially challenged community. I've been involved in uh, sanctioned and unsanctioned murals for over 26 years. Graffiti was my escape from gang life. You either had to be different or you had to be different in Chicago. Smash Forward 26 years, Up Art Studio was born. When, we, when I was gifted the use of a space by a friend, a patron, and a believer. When we opened the doors of Up Art Studio, um, we did it to help remove the negative stigma associated with graffiti and to help graffiti and street artists make the transition from the street to the fine art world, should they choose to do that, and to, and to, um, and to prove that aerosol art is a true and viable medium. Let's talk about... <laughs> Passing the mic. The evolution of graffiti. Let's start with... The tag, everybody loves this, right? This is where someone is either given their name or they make up a name and they learn their font. We go to the next step, which is the outline, the throw up, the toss up. It's the same thing as a tag. Then we, then we go to the fill in, where we start learning the principles of art, shape, form, color, your primary and your secondary colors, shadows, highlights. Then we go to the next step, which is the pinnacle of a graffiti writer, their piece. It's the same thing as the tag. It's the stylized version of his name. Then we move on to a production where individuals create these murals. And then they sign these murals. They sign them a little bigger, though. <laughs> and to the natural evolution, which an artist gets to if he sticks with this long enough, which he actually becomes a viable source of income for them. And I found a quote online that I think sums this up best. People hate the tags, but they want the murals. There's a misunderstanding and people don't realize that it's all connected and all related. You can't have the mural without the tag. You can't have the mural without the artist evolution. When we launched Up Art Studio, if we could play the video, please. When we launched Up Art Studio, we curated a monthly series of art shows where we had the walls painted inside and out every month. We often had neighbors stopping by to say how much they looked forward to seeing which mural was going to come next. Our neighbors were proud of what we were doing. Our neighbors were proud of what we were doing, and we were proud to be doing it for our neighborhood. Hmm. We have a difficult, di di yeah. yeah. All right. So, the the word started to spread about what we were doing. We started having bigger and bigger attendees to our events. Then we worked our way up into curating a show on Gallery Row in a traditional commercial art space. We celebrated our first uh, year anniversary with a trip to Wynwood for, for Art Week during Art Basel, or as I like to call it, Artie Gras. <laughs> we created our first unsanctioned mural production in Miami. Then when we came back to Houston, we started uh, to help produce the biggest mural in Houston. This mural is a city block wide by, by five stories tall. It's 10, 000, just shy of 10,000 square feet. And we helped by providing um, support with project management, event planning, marketing. And just under three months, we raised over $100,000 and um, executed the production of the mural as well as um, two uh, very large scale events. And, um, and it, there was also, let me show this. Sorry. <laughs> there was also, you can see there the events, and then uh, there was an insane amount of media attention as well. So, due to that positive and negative feedback we received during the Biggest Mural Project, we realized that it would be best serve our community 
by creating public art projects. Because what we did is we educated, we moved and we engaged individuals. We had school children stopping by who had no idea what the creation was. And we all know that it's one of the most reappropriated images in the world. But these individuals did not. So we, we enlightened them. We moved people who came by and, and, and realized what this image meant to them and engaged. Well, we had the entire art community, from the fine art to the street art community, talking about this project. And it was, and it was through this okay. project that we learned the formula to making a, a, a project like this successful. We team up with a nonprofit that has a similar mission to us, and by doing that, they provide a fiscal agency, which means donations to the project are tax deductible. So it makes it a little bit easier to raise the funds to uh, pull off a large-scale project such as this. And after the biggest mural, we went to Miami again, and uh, this time we helped create a pop-up gallery out of a very raw space, um, and we curated the Liquitex Lounge, and um, we worked with several international artists. Speaking of artists, in, in, over, in under two years, we worked with over 100 internationally recognized artists, from emerging to established. During that time, we also began to study other public arts programs around the world. There, there are many. And we assembled a top-notch advisory board, and one that was passionate seeing, about seeing public arts in Houston as well. And in the midst of our research, we came across many cities that had pa painted tra traffic signal control cabinets. And we thought, if everyone else is doing it, why, why, not, not why not Houston? So we started the mini murals. Wow. In late uh, 2014, we began to, to seek out support. support for our sponsors, for our idea. We reached out to Public Works and Engineering, Jeff Weatherford, and to our delight and surprise, they were really excited about the project. During that time, we met with Manette Basil of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. Then we went to Houston Arts Alliance where we met with the Director of Civic Arts, Sarah Kellner. And everyone agreed that this project made sense. The project was then awarded fiscal sponsorship from Fresh Arts, again, making all donations to the project tax deductible. And we also engaged the services of the East End Foundation, who typically does the graffiti abatement, but they actually help us to prep and prime the boxes and then clear coat them so that we can ensure um, the, you know, the life of the boxes and we can ensure that the art does not get um, defaced. Also known as the buff man, the graffiti writer's <laughs> nemesis. <laughs> So with the, then after we had everybody on board that we needed in order to make the project success, successful, we went, started meeting with all of the council members. We met with nine out of the 11, and out of, out of those, council member Larry Green was very excited from the very beginning. He saw the vision of what this project could do for his district. He immediately, um, you know, he told us at the beginning, and I think we went to him and we said, well, we think maybe it would be really cool if you could maybe do five or 10, he said, I'll do better than that. I want to do 20. Then he came back and he said, you know what, let's do 31. Let's go ahead and do, <laughs> let's go ahead and just do it. So thanks to him, um, his, his district is now, and I'm going to run through a few photos. He, he knew that this project would bring the cultural excellence to his neighborhood or to his district, um, his district that deserved it, that had for so long been deprived of public art. And, um, and bring it to them. And so it's now a destination. It's a place where people now do bike tours. People you know, do self-guided <laughs> tours. They're a lot of fun. And you'll see. Some, some are you know, <laughs> political. Council Member Green realized that this project would bring a certain amount of cultural excellence that this community deserves. And with this one pilot phase, it rivals the amount of public art in all of the outer loop of Houston, just with this one, one phase. And with that being said too, some of what they're counting as public art in the outer loop are things like a portrait of you know, someone who the neighborhood is named after and it's sitting in the public library, which most of us probably won't see. So the definition is a little, a little different. 
Through the support of other, pa of, of other patrons and of the arts, the program continues to grow and spread across Houston. We're now working on our capital fund campaign, and this is the proof and concept box that was created. This is a box created in the Fifth Ward, affectionately known as the Nickel. It has been since the Emancipation Proclamation was written, and we had individuals come into Houston. Ah, here's a little uh, civic pride through civic art. This is outside of our neighborhood. I mentioned I come from an economically and socially challenged neighborhood. Well, I still actually continue to work in a, in a social and economically challenged neighborhood. I, our studio's in the Fifth Ward, and this is one of those projects that, when you think of music in the Fifth Ward, you think of the Ghetto Boys, not Peacock Records. This is the first uh, box sponsored outside of the pilot phase that we created. This was created for the Houston Zoo. And the media attention has been wild. It, we have the you know, front page of the Houston Chronicle. We have been on every single TV station, Arts Inside on PBS. It has been truly amazing. The amount of support that we've received, not only from the media, but from the community. And I just want to read a, a couple of, of quotes from, uh, or a couple of testimonials uh, from uh, the internet. Um, I saw some utility boxes painted in, in New Orleans near City Park, but they were not as well done as ours. <laughs> as ours. As ours. As ours. Again, embodying civic pride through civic art. You then see some council member supports. We had a proclamation day. Um, I think you need to come out to Cyprus and do some of these. We get those emails almost daily. Hobby, Montrose, you know, so many people wanting them in their neighborhoods. Yay, I love how the art scene is finally coming over to the southwest side. The Heights, Midtown, and Edo is played out. Time, time, it's time for the southwest to get some recognition. Hope they go up in more parts of town. Thank you. Houston is more beautiful because of these murals. I'm so appreciative and everyone being exposed to art. Great project, great collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, civic pride through civic art. We have a little video that we would like for you to watch. Please enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. It's a beautiful day in Houston. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to finally see this day. are the traffic signal control cabinets, otherwise known as electrical boxes or, or traffic boxes. And the first box was created by Anat Ronan for the uh, pilot phase of our project. I uh, had the honor of painting the first one. I can't think of a city more appropriate for uh, public art or street art um, than Houston. It's, uh, excuse me, it's not too pretty. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great, great, great um, canvas for us. So just let us paint. It's extremely special for me because I'm a huge arts fan and uh, this is an opportunity for me to bring in art uh, to the entire district and uh, we were pleased to have the opportunity to use our council service budget uh, for projects like this and to allow actually local artists to have the opportunity uh, to show their work all around the city. It's really exciting. Let's uh, give them another warm round of applause. Noah and Ellie Aquiles. <laughs> 